Right now, Speaker Mike Johnson is facing a revolt from inside his own party over his decision to finally put aid to Ukraine up for a vote in the House. Johnson had resisted doing that for months, but this week he finally relented. Here he was explaining the reality of what he is facing just a few hours ago. I'm operating with the smallest margin in U.S. history. I have a one-vote margin. Listen, we're not going to get 100 percent of what we want right now because we have the smallest majority in history, and we only have the majority in one chamber. Despite what Speaker Johnson understands here, far-right members of his party are now saying they will call a vote to oust Johnson over his decision to bring up Ukraine aid. And that's going to go to the floor for a vote. That is how much the far right does not want to help Ukraine combat Russia's war of aggression. And this is not just a problem for the Republican Party. It is a problem for Ukraine and America and the rest of the world. Because Ukraine and the vote on Ukraine funding has become a leverage point for Russia. The Washington Post has some explosive reporting today on newly revealed documents from inside Vladimir Putin's government, documents which show how Russia is seeking to subvert Western support for Ukraine and disrupt the domestic politics of the United States and European countries through propaganda campaigns and supporting isolationist and extremist policies. Russia is fomenting division over Ukraine because it wants to weaken America's role in the world. In particular, one Russian policy expert cited in one of these documents specifically calls on Russia to continue to facilitate the coming to power of isolationist right-wing forces in America. Just to put a finer point on this. Russia very much wants the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world to continue doing exactly what they're doing because it serves Russia's interests. This is not the only piece of evidence we have of that. Last week, two top House Republicans warned that pro-Russian propaganda had infiltrated the Republican Party and was being repeated by Republican members of Congress in debates about Ukraine. Earlier this week, Marjorie Taylor Greene parroted Vladimir Putin's central lie justifying his invasion of Ukraine by calling the Ukrainian government Nazis. Ukraine, for the record, is the only nation in the world other than Israel to have a Jewish head of state, Vladimir Zelensky. But Marjorie Taylor Greene wants to block aid to that country because she says it is run by Nazis. So who knows where this vote on Ukraine aid could lead? Republicans could vote to remove Speaker Johnson and once again throw the House of Representatives and therefore much of our American government again into chaos, something that would directly serve Russia's ends. And maybe that is the whole point. Joining me now is Senator Chris Murphy, Democrat from Connecticut. He is a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Senator Murphy, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, First, let me just get your reaction to the reporting we have out of the Post about the way in which Ru Russia is delighted to see the infighting over Ukraine aid unfolding in the U.S. Congress. Well, of course they are, because the only way that they can win in Ukraine is if the United States withdraws its support uh, for Ukraine. And you know, let's be clear about why we care so much about stopping Russia from taking over Ukraine. It's not just because we have a sympathy and a kinship for the Ukrainian people. It's because Putin has made clear that he's not going to stop at Ukraine. And if he is given the entire country uh, very quickly, he could be moving on to a NATO ally. That will be U.S. troops. That'll be U.S. Uh, men and women, Americans fighting and dying in Europe. That'll be a green light to China to invade Taiwan, potentially erupting uh, a regional war in Southeast Asia. This is cataclysmic for U.S. interests. Um, the triggers that could be set off by Putin winning so expeditiously in Ukraine only because the United States abandons them there. So there is no doubt that Putin is spending a lot of money here in the United States and in Europe trying to undermine support for Ukraine, trying to support individuals who are trying to argue against Ukraine funding. And listen, there's no doubt that he is rooting 
very badly for Donald Trump. There's no doubt that he will likely play a big role in this upcoming election, because if we get this bill across the finish line, Alex, if we do fund Ukraine, it'll only be through the beginning of next year. And if Donald Trump is elected, that's a pretty clear guarantee that this would be the last Ukraine funding bill that would ever clear the House Senate and get passed uh, and signed into law by the president. To that end, I just want to draw everyone's attention to a quote from Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who's a Russian opposition figure. And he says, the Americans consider that insofar as they are not directly participating in the war in Ukraine, then any loss is not their loss. This is an absolute misunderstanding. A defeat for Ukraine, he said, means that many will stop fearing challenging the U.S. and the costs for the United States will only increase. It feels like some people in the Senate, in the Republican Party, understand the importance here of not empowering the isolationists, both as a matter of sort of Republican functionality and also in, in terms of the cause of, of Western-style liberal democracy around the world. Do you think the fact that Speaker Johnson is willing to bring up this Ukraine uh, aid funding to the chagrin of the far-right members of his caucus is a signal that House Republicans are finally beginning to realize that they have been employed as useful idiots for the Kremlin? Uh, no, <laughs> I, I would not go that far. Uh, it seems as if Speaker Johnson has made a, an individual decision um, that it would be a disaster for the United States to abandon Ukraine. And I think he knows that this would be his legacy, right? His political obituary would lead with his abandonment of Ukraine because he has a coalition of Democrats and Republicans that support Ukraine. The Senate has already voted uh, 70 to 30 with a big bipartisan majority for Ukraine. So he knows it's it would be him and him only that would get the blame for handing Ukraine to Vladimir Putin. Um, so I don't think this suggests any conversion inside the Republican Party to understand the way they've been influenced by Russia. I think it's Speaker Johnson making the right decision in the here and now. And for today, at least, we should celebrate that. Do you have an expectation that we're going to be looking for a new Speaker of the House? And if we are, what's your expectation for the U.S. Congress and what happens next? So, uh, you know, my my sense is, is that there are some Democrats who will oppose a motion to vacate in the House of Representatives should Speaker Johnson go through with his proposal to bring aid to Ukraine, aid to Israel and humanitarian assistance before the House. And should that be successful? He needs to get enough Republicans to support it so that alongside Democrats, it passes the House and moves to the Senate. Uh, so it's possible that he will survive a motion to vacate because there will be a handful of Democrats who will support him. And the reality is, is right now the only way to pass anything through the House of Representatives is a coalition of mostly Democrats, because the majority of Republicans in the House are just full time arsonists. They are inside government to destroy government, to destroy the legitimacy of government, to try to burn down the government. And so, you know, whether it's votes to for who, who's the next speaker, whether it's votes to pass Ukraine aid, votes to pass a budget, it's really still Democrats that are the only thing that keep that place functional. And Johnson has finally realized that. In case you missed it, this is how most of today was spent in the House Education Committee hearing on anti-Semitism at Columbia University. I didn't get to fit. I, I, I have your answer. No. <laughs> uh, let, me, let, me, let me move on here. Republicans brought in Congress brought Columbia University President Manoush Shafiq down to Washington, less to hear her answers and more to pointedly say questions at her. Now, if the Republicans in the committee were actually listening, President Shafiq was quite clear. Here was her response to a question about whether anti-Semitic speech is tolerated at Columbia. It's abhorrent and has uh, and it has no place in our community. I think one of the issues that we are actively debating now, and which David Schizer, I hope, as part of the anti-Semitism task force, will help us find solutions, as you've asked for, Congresswoman, is to actually clarify where language crosses the line from protected speech to discriminatory or harassing speech. President Shafiq was very precise there. The debate that should be happening on college campuses right now is the one about where the line is between First Amendment speech and discriminatory speech. That is a very worthwhile conversation. But that is not the conversation we saw in the House today. Instead, 
we saw stuff like this. How many, do you just in your own mind, could you rattle off like 10 Republican-ish faculty out of your 4,000 off the top of your head? Yeah, I could actually, but um, we have two of our uh, fellows from our Institute for Global Politics who are former Trump oh, administration now, Let me officials. give you another question. What does a number of Republicans on the faculty at Columbia have to do with anti-Semitism? We're going to get to that. The congressman asking the question there clearly did not like that President Shafiq could answer his question. It didn't fit the narrative that he was trying to establish. A narrative other Republicans tried to cement with questions like these. Can you explain why the word folks is spelled F-O-L-X throughout this guidebook and in other places at the School of Social Work? Is this how Columbia University students. spells the word folks? No. What does a student group spelling the word folks with an X to be gender inclusive, what does that have to do with anti-Semitism? Well, both that question and the one asking President Shafiq, how many Republicans are on the Columbia faculty, both of those questions have a lot to do with the conversation Republicans were actually trying to have in the House today. A week ago, a group of Jewish faculty members at Columbia published this open letter to President Shafiq, imploring her not to fall for the exact Republican campaign we saw in that committee hearing room today. Rather than being concerned with the safety and well-being of Jewish students on campuses, the committee is leveraging anti-Semitism in a wider effort to caricature and demonize universities as hotbeds of woke indoctrination. In December, Republicans on the House Education Committee questioned the presidents of Harvard, MIT, and the University of Pennsylvania about anti-Semitism. Days later, the president of the University of Pennsylvania, Elizabeth McGill, resigned. And then, after enduring a month of additional personal and professional attacks, the president of Harvard, Claudine Gay, also resigned. And now, today, it was the president of Columbia University, Manoush Shafiq, who Republicans had in the hot seat. Joining me now to help unpack what is actually happening on Columbia's campus and what these hearings are really about is Jelani Cobb, Dean of the Columbia University School of Journalism. Dean Cobb, it is great to see you. I know it has been a busy time on campus. Can you give me a sense of, of what is happening uh, on, on your campus? There was a hearing today where I feel like we didn't actually really get an accurate picture of, of how deep the battle lines run and what the fundamental arguments are about. Mm -hmm. Well, it's contested. You know, there are, uh, you know, debates, there are heated debates happening, there are protests and demonstrations and counter protests and counter demonstrations. Uh, and, you know, just as this has become, uh, you know, a hugely polarizing issue on, in lots of different avenues of American life, you know, we're seeing that play out on a university campus where people are supposed to engage with ideas, uh, they're supposed to debate, they're supposed to think about these things critically and so on. So we are seeing a lot of that happening. Uh, and in addition, on the day to day, people are going to class, learning, you know, reading, preparing to graduate and all the other things that happen in a normal academic year. Is there a conversation about, I mean, um, President Shafiq got at this in the hearing today, that the conversation needs to be about what is free speech and what is discriminatory speech. Is, sure. is, that, a, is that a debate that is happening to any end at this point on, at the Columbia University? So campus? the irony of this, and this is the debate that we've, we've had serially, you know, long before this conflict began. This was a, a debate and a, a robust issue that we should be debating mm -hmm. on uh, college campuses. Now, of course, the irony of this is that, you know, the president was being questioned by Congress, which actually has purview over this. It makes legislation yes. and laws. Uh, and, you know, the Supreme Court, which determines, you know, by precedence what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. And, and so really universities are being beaten up, you know, and in Columbia in, in particular being beaten up over things that we have really no control over. We're mm -hmm. following the guidance of the people who are actually doing the questioning there. Well, it seems like to that end, what was happening in Congress today wasn't really about Columbia. It wasn't necessarily about anti-Semitism. It seemed like it was very clearly an opportunity for Republicans to go after what they perceived to be a group of liberal elites and the wokeism that is uh, that has penetrated America's uh, college campus system. Um, did you think that they were successful in maligning Columbia University today? 
I mean, they've said all kinds of things about Columbia University. Yeah. And that's not the institution that I think, you know, most of us experience. Even though, you know, there have been incidents of anti-Semitism, no question. Uh, and those incidents have been denounced, you know, broadly by that community. But what we've seen uh, in place of this has been a kind of disingenuous caricature mm. of what the university is, what the university stands for, who our students are, who our faculty are, you know, what's going on. Uh, and that's been, you know, not simply, you know, today, that's been going on for, for weeks before this. Uh, and so, you know, listening to that hearing, you would not think that there was anything redeemable, you know, happening at Columbia University. Do you, do you think, I mean, it, it seems that the, the war in Gaza and the absolute schism that has been created in its aftermath, and some would say predating the war in Gaza, has been a political opportunity for Republicans and conservatives in particular to kind of get at the culture of wokeism and the culture of liberal elites. Like, I, not to be repetitive, but I, but I do wonder how effective they have been in, in turning some part of the country against what is perceived as, you know, higher institutions. Sure. But I, I think that one of the like more pernicious things and one of the more disingenuous things here is the uh, presentation of this as if this were a kind of matter of principle. Mm -hmm. What this is really about is the perception that uh, universities are too liberal, especially elite institutions are too liberal. Uh, so this is, you know, a part of is on par with the attacks on DEI. It's on par with the attacks on affirmative action. It's, uh, you know, kind of following the playbook of what we've seen happen at New College in Florida, yeah. for instance. So the idea is supposed to be that we're uh, that laying the ground for these institutions to be something other than what they are perceived to be. Now, these are also heterogeneous institutions. Yeah. I teach opinion writing. I have students whose views are all across the spectrum, as you will find at this university, at the institution. Uh, and so, Republicans attend Columbia, too, in other words. Shockingly enough, they do, actually. They do. Yeah, and, and I've actually taught a few, amazingly. But, but that's not what, you know, n none of these issues of substance were on display there. Um, this was a kind of theater in order to caricature the university to further an agenda of, uh, uh, of kind of making it more difficult for our institutions to function the way that they have. Yeah, I will say, uh, we, if we have time, I would love to play an exchange between um, President Shafiq and Representative Rick Allen, who was asking if uh, she wanted Columbia to be cursed by God. Can we, mm. can we play that? Are you familiar with Genesis 12, 3? If you bless Israel, I will bless you. If you curse Israel, I will curse you. Do you consider that a serious issue? I mean, do you want Columbia University to be cursed by God of the Bible? <laughs> Definitely not. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good. It's, it's like a very curious logic to somehow bring in white Christian nationalism in a conversation that's supposed to be about anti-Semitism. I'm not going to get into the circuitous logic by which Representative um, Allen got there, but it does betray the sort of underpinnings of this argument, right? It is a, it is a culture war. It is about Republican, white Christian national conservatism against heterogeneous, her, uh, like multicultural liberal learning. And that is the fight that they want to have. Yeah, I also thought it was race baiting the president yeah. who was of Egyptian origin. Um, I think asking if you're familiar with Genesis was was a kind of dig in that direction. Uh, and so it was thinly veiled. Like what was happening here was the most thinly veiled uh, of uh, the most pernicious parts of what we've seen. You know, particularly given uh, you know the proliferation of anti-Semitism that we have seen in the right wing of that yeah. party itself. Right. Uh, and so. So maybe the mirror should be turned upon the party in, in the line of questioning. I, I do got to, I have to ask you, you know, we talk about this as a kind of a, 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 an exercise in politics, but it has had some real consequences. The number of university heads who have had to step down that have, you know, had to leave their posts or have been otherwise, you know, seriously professionally wounded in the course of this. Does that make you worry? Do you think we're turning a corner when the sort of you know, the goals of, of, of at least one side in this have been revealed to be not potentially that pure? So I think the, the real concern is that when we're in a moment of democratic crisis, you know, and this goes back to the 1950s when we're talking about the Cold War. How do you handle challenges to your democracy? 
the way that you handle challenges to your democracy is by being more democratic. Mm -hmm. You have to double and triple down on your principles. And so to see these kind of assaults on free speech and on academic freedom at a point where we are also seeing other parts of our democratic tradition being assailed is chilling, is deeply chilling. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.